Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA Network Plus certification training course, the online training course with its own personal iris code. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about troubleshooting common logical connectivity issues. This comes from our Network Plus exam in 10 004, section 4.7 where we need to understand how to troubleshoot whenever we're having problems communicating on the network. So we're going to talk about these logical problems, port speed, duplex mismatches, incorrect VLANs, incorrect IP addresses, gateways, DNSs, and subnet masks. How would we troubleshoot that? What's the process we should go through? We'll go through all of that in this module. Let's start with port speed. Port speed is a great place to start because that's usually one of the first questions that you're going to deal with when you're installing a new piece of equipment. How fast should this piece of equipment be transmitting over the network? Ethernet obviously can transmit at a lot of different speeds, and it depends on the capabilities of the device that you're plugging in and the capabilities of the infrastructure device to which it will be plugged. So this could be in your switch, in your router, in your hubs, in the workstation itself. Everything needs to sync up. And Ethernet can obviously run at 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, 1,000 megabits per second, which is 1 gig, and even 10 gig per second on some very high-speed Ethernet networks. So when we start trying to determine how we want to set up the port speed, we need to make sure that everybody's running at the same speed. And one of the nice things about Ethernet is that it has this capability called auto-negotiation. The idea is that we can set our workstation to auto-negotiate, we can set a switch to auto-negotiate, and we plug them in, and they will all run at exactly the right speed and exactly the right duplex. Wouldn't that be great if that happened every time? Unfortunately, auto is not always auto, as auto as it should be. And what we find is sometimes one device will set itself to 100 megabit full duplex, another device will set itself to 100 megabit half duplex, and then we have a problem because those two have to match in order to have the traffic flow well between those two systems and not create any problems for us. So sometimes auto works fine. And it's something that becomes a philosophical issue in your environment. You use auto all the time, and it works well for the equipment you're using more power to you. But you may run into situations where a new network card or a new piece of equipment may need to be hard coded. You may need to tell the switch that this device is going to run at 100 megabit and it's going to run at full duplex. And then tell your device that you're going to run at 100 megabit and you're going to run at full duplex so that those two know from the very get go, don't even bother with that automatic process. Just go ahead and run at 100 megabit full. And since we've hard coded it, everything should be working just fine and it's perfectly identical on both sides. Along with port speed, we have to make sure our duplexing matches. As I was just discussing, it's not all about the speed. We have to make sure that it's running at half duplex or full duplex. Half duplex, as you recall, means that one side speaks at a time. You can communicate down the link as a transmit, or you could receive data, but you can't do both at the same time. That's why full duplex became so useful and almost everybody's running at full duplex these days because there's two separate channels. You can send traffic and receive traffic at the same time and ne'er the twain shall meet. And in that way, there's no collisions. We can run at very high rates of speed. It's very efficient in the way that it operates. We don't have to worry about these two sides creating problems or creating collisions with each other because they can send and receive simultaneously. If those are mismatched, we're going to have slow performance. Somebody's going to complain that they aren't getting the throughput when they do file transfers, when they talk out to the web, when they start surfing around. So an ideal uh, situation is to perform a speed test. What type of throughput are you getting? And you'll, you may see in upload and download, you're getting a dramatically slower speed than what you were expecting. Sometimes if you look at your Ethernet adapter statistics, there will be errors listed in there. And you can look to see, are you sending or receiving errors on this link? And if you are, it may be because there's a mismatch with the duplex. You may have to hard code that to make sure there's no problems with the mismatching. To hard code a workstation, you can usually go into the properties of the network card itself. Here, for instance, is a Windows 7 Broadcom adapter. These are the gigabit Ethernet properties for this card. And you can see for the speed and duplex, notice that 10 and 100 is where I can set speeds and duplex. Gig communication 
almost always, well, it does always run at full duplex. There, There is within these Ethernet specification, as an aside here, there within the Ethernet specification for gigabit, there is a specification for half duplex gigabit, but nobody ever created any technologies, any hardware that would support half duplex. So everything that you plug into from a gig perspective is always going to be full duplex by default. And that's why whenever we pull this down, it has 10 megabit full and 10 megabit half, or we can hard code it to 100 megabit full or 100 megabit half. If you're running at gigabit, you just plug it into auto. It's going to run at gig and it's going to run at full duplex by default. If you're plugging into a network and you've been given some IP addressing and you plug in and you're not communicating on the network, it may be because you're plugging into an incorrect VLAN. And you'll often have this configured on the switch. The switch knows what you're plugging into and it's decided you are on card number one on port number three and I've configured that port to be on VLAN 10. And as long as that's the right workstation configuration for VLAN 10 and that matches up to the switch, you're fine. It's when there's not the right VLAN becomes an issue. You may have some IP addressing on your device that should be on VLAN 5. And since the switch is configured for VLAN 10, it's never going to be able to communicate via IP out over that network. And so you're not you're going to have what we call loss of connectivity. It's just not going to be able to talk out on the network. Usually this is when it's really configured manually. If it's an automatic configuration for IP, you don't generally run into this type of issue because you're automatically assigned the correct IP address for the VLAN that you happen to be on. What's important about this, though, is that often in a very large environment, your firewall or other security devices may be configured to allow you access through the network based on your IP subnet. And if you're on the wrong VLAN, then you're on the wrong IP subnet. It's a completely different IP subnet for each VLAN, after all. So we need to make sure that if we're in the marketing department, that we're on the marketing VLAN so that I get a marketing IP address that allows me access to marketing resources. See how important that is? If those don't all match up, then we may have a problem from a security perspective. To configure the VLAN, we can make sure we're on the right network by pinging our default gateway. And if I can ping my gateway, then I'm on the right VLAN. I've got the right IP addressing, and I can see my local router, and therefore, I should be able to communicate out over the network. If you must configure your VLAN inside of your workstation, you can usually do it again in your Gigabit Ethernet properties for the card. We're back looking at my device that's running Gigabit Ethernet with this Broadcom card. And I have a selection in here where I can hard code the VLAN ID for the communication that I'm going to send in and out of this workstation. Now you can see the default VLAN ID is zero. And this can go up to 4096. That's a lot of different VLANs that you can have running over a single link. Generally, people will have a handful of VLANs VLANs, sometimes more, sometimes less. But uh, configuring it on the workstation isn't normally done. Usually it just defines the VLAN automatically on your switching environment, and it goes from there. But if you're in an environment that has a workstation where you need to define the VLAN because you're on that kind of trunk link, perhaps it's a security design for what you're doing, make sure you configure it right in your network card properties. Whenever you're first configuring a device and you're putting in a static IP address and subnet mask, you want to put those in first off. They're extremely important. In fact, they are required. If you don't put any other configuration information into this machine, that's fine. Because at a very bare minimum, I must have an IP address. I must have a subnet mask to be able to communicate to the, out on the network. They also have to be right. Sorry about that, but you're going to have to make sure they're absolutely correct. There's really no room here for error. If you get your IP address wrong, it's not going to be able to communicate at what you were expecting it to be. And if the subnet mask is wrong, your, your computer is going to think it's on the wrong subnet or it's on a smaller subnet or larger subnet than what it really is. Usually, I double check these things, especially if somebody else gave me the IP address and they tell you, oh, that's 192.168.0.4 and your subnet mask is 255, 255, 255, And I'll type it in, and I'll read it back to them. OK, I typed in 192.186, and they go, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. It's 168. So you need to make sure that you're putting the right thing in. And it's kind of nice to troubleshoot this right off the bat to double check. That way, you're not going to have a problem with it later. A good way to confirm that you've configured it properly is to make sure you can ping your own IP address and then make sure that you're pinging the default gateway on your network. If you didn't put a default gateway in, obviously you can't ping one quite yet. Well, you could ping one, but you won't know how to route to it. That's a very good way to tell if you're on the right subnet and it thinks the computer thinks it's on the right subnet is we try to ping what should be a default gateway out of the subnet that we're on. Let's try that. 
Let's try pinging my local IP address and try pinging my default gateway and see if I've got them configured right in my machine. Now I've been given a static IP address of 192.168.0.7. Let's see if I'm able to ping myself. Yes, I am. And I'm able to see that I'm working properly. So at least I configure my network card. It is now operational inside of my machine. And I'm able to communicate at least down to the network card level. But can I get across the network? I know that the default gateway on my network is 192.168.0.1. So let's run a ping to that IP address. And if I've configured my IP address and subnet mask and I'm communicating out on the network properly, then I should be able then to get to that IP address, and certainly I am. So now I feel pretty comfortable. If I can ping my local gateway, I should be able then to ping other places outside of my network. And I can feel pretty comfortable that the IP address that I have isn't conflicting with anybody else. And the subnet mask that I have is probably correct as well. We would need to ping outside of our subnet to make sure that's the case. So you may even want to go an extra step here and ping something maybe on the internet. A good example of this is a, one of the, the root DNS servers, which is 4.2.2.2. .2 .2. It's just an easy one to type in. If there's another IP address on the internet you'd like to try, try anything that's outside of your subnet. And if I type that, you can see I'm not only pinging my own IP address, I'm not only pinging my router, I'm pinging out to the internet and back again. So that's a really good useful tool to make sure that I know I'm communicating in and out of this network. If I'm having a problem at this point, it doesn't have to do with my IP addressing. Another very important thing to put into your default configuration is your default gateway. Now, this isn't a, an ex a critical piece if you're only going to communicate on the same subnet. It's just nobody ever does that. Nobody ever just communicates on their same subnet. They want to be able to communicate outside of their IP subnet. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you put in a default gateway so that your computer knows, if I need to talk out to another subnet, I should probably talk to that router that's on my network. And again, we confirm that by pinging something that's outside of my subnet. It can be an internal router on somewhere else on your network. It can be a server that's somewhere else on your network. I just gave you the example of using 4.2.2.2. That's a good all around choice. And you'll find if somebody comes into your environment and they're doing network troubleshooting, you'll see them ping that address. It's a very common one we use, probably because it's just so easy to type in. And there's some other ones out there. You just happen to find a favorite for you. And so that you can always have something that's outside of these subnets to be able to make sure you know that it's going to respond back on a ping. And we'll just try the 4.2.2.2 to see if our routing is working properly and making sure that our default gateway is set up the way it should be. Another IP configuration is a DNS server. That's one of the other options you have when you're putting in your IP address and your subnet mask and your default gateway. One of the things that you're often asked is what DNS server is what you like to use. And what a DNS server does is convert these names that we put in, like google.com, convert it to an IP address so that then we can route that traffic out to Google. We can also put in IP addresses and have it convert back what the name of that device really is too. So these DNS servers work in both directions. We can confirm that our DNS configuration is working properly by using a tool that's built into our operating system called NSLOOKUP. Comes with Windows. There's an NSLOOKUP for Linux and Unix type environments. Uh, if you can't get out, you can't browse to a name, you can't browse to google.com, may not be a routing issue. It may be that you've put in the wrong DNS server. So try doing an NS lookup for google.com. Let's see if we get anything back. Back to my command prompt. Let's run that NS lookup for www.google.com. Let's see what we get. Well, it says that I'm using a certain server that's on Comcast. That makes sense because that is the server and the network that I'm on. And it says for Google.com, it actually resolves back to www.l.google.com. And here are all the addresses that I could communicate to go to Google.com. So Google, obviously, extremely redundant and resilient with the type of servers they have, the number of servers they have in their environment. So I have multiple places I could go to just to get to www.google.com. Let's do another one. Let's do NS lookup. Let's go to Microsoft. If we type it right, Microsoft.com. There we go. And let's see what answers we get. Well, for Microsoft, a little bit different. You can see that they are using a different set of services that go to a lot of different names. Microsoft has servers all over the world. They're not all at a Microsoft.com domain. They use third parties often to be able to distribute their software and their web services throughout the world. And so you may get back a name that doesn't look anything like Microsoft. The only part of this that looks like Microsoft is the letters MS inside of that. But behind the scenes, 
You don't care. As long as it goes to the right IP address and you're getting to the Microsoft Web Services, it should be working properly. And if we're able to get an answer back and we're able to see these IP addresses, then you will know that your NS configuration, your DNS configuration that you put in is working properly. Let's review some of the things we've learned with our logical connectivity issues. Our first question, what configuration option defines your local subnet? There was a set of numbers we put in that told your system what subnet it was on, and that is our subnet mask. Our next question is, what configuration option defines the virtual local area network where you might be located? We talked about that as being the network that's used by the marketing department, for instance, and that would be the marketing VLAN or virtual local area network. And which configuration option configures the router that's used to access external IP subnets? We want to know how can we use something outside of the IP subnet we're on? What device should we be talking to and how do we configure that? Well, that's our default gateway. That is the router that we're going to use to talk outside of this subnet. This concludes this module for local connectivity issues. We've gone through port speeds and duplex mismatches, all the way through gateways and DNSs and subnet masks. And by now, you should have a pretty good idea of exactly what you'll need to know just to make sure you're able to resolve some of the logical problems you'll run into with connectivity. Thanks for joining us in this module. If you'd like to see many more of our Network Plus videos, participate in our message boards, send me an email, or much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.